Welcome to our first lecture in B204, Introduction to Cell Biology. In this lecture, we're going to talk all about Chapter 1, but let's talk about this course a little bit first. This is a semester-long course that's going to focus on the biology of the cell, specifically eukaryotic cells. Now, we will reference the prokaryotic cell throughout the semester, but our main focus is going to be on that eukaryotic machinery. This class will be taught at the pace and the rigor of an upper division course, a 300, 400 level course, because this class transfers to many institutions as a 300 level course. And we want to make sure that you're not missing out on any of that information. These first couple chapters, chapters 1, 2, and 3, are going to be review for you, or should be review for you. They'll be grouped as one lecture per chapter, rather than broken down into topics as I will later on in the semester. You should have seen most of this material in either your B201 class or if you've taken microbiology before. So it shouldn't be anything too surprising here. Let's go ahead and get started with chapter one. In every chapter, we're going to have an outline. Um, and as I said, we'll break these down into topics a little bit later, but right now we just have these um, first few chapters are broken down into um, one big lecture for you because they should be about 15 to 30 minutes at most. When we get into the bigger chapters I'm going to break those down into a couple sections so they're about 15 minute chunks so that it's easier to get through the material. For this lecture we're going to go through the objectives for chapter one and then we're going to talk about what the study of cell biology is, an overview of cells, and then we're going to talk about some of the methodologies that we use to perform cell biology. Methodology is going to be a big portion of this class. I want you to start getting a un firm understanding for lab techniques because this is going to be a big part of your future curriculum in your other classes. These are the objectives. Every chapter or topic will have objectives associated with them. These can serve as your study guide for the unit exam. I expect you to have all of these mastered by the time we have the unit exam. What I want you to do with these is use them as your study guide, use them as a tool to help you assess where your knowledge is. These are the things that in class, if you're not feeling comfortable with something that you should be bringing up for discussion so that we can work through them further during our in-class time because that's our time to really focus and dig in on those troubling issues rather than trying to cover all of these things in one, um, one, and a half hour, one hour and 50 minute class. So we're going to start off our lecture with the study of cell biology. So why do we study cell biology? And we're going to also talk about the primary focus within eukaryotes. And remember, we're going to talk about the two of those, um, two different cells here in just a little bit, just as a refresher for you. So now let's go through a quick overview of what cells are. Um, in this course, as I keep telling you over and over again, we're going to focus on eukaryotic cells, but we have to also understand prokaryotic cells because we need to be able to compare and contrast these two different cell models so that we can understand them. And of course, as you're well aware of with the theory of evolution, that all of our cells came from one progenitor cell, so it's important to understand how these cell groups deviate. So the first thing we need to talk about is what are cells. Cells are the smallest unit of life. I'm sure that in one of your classes you've heard about the properties of life. And depending on who you, um, which class you've taken them from, which textbook you've used, there's generally seven properties of life that have been agreed upon. And cells are the smallest unit of life that possess all of these properties of life. Okay, and we're not gonna, I don't expect you to memorize all the properties of life again, but I want you to understand that this is the smallest unit of life. One of the big keys to cells, so they all contain nucleic acid information in the form of either DNA or RNA. DNA serves as the genetic blueprint of the cell, whereas RNA is this go-between that helps get the information from the DNA into proteins that are useful within the cell. So it's important to understand that. But remember, regardless of what the cell's primary function is, such as in a multicellular organism like the liver cell, I could take a liver cell and it will still contain all of the genetic information of that organism. Because every cell at the very beginning has the information to become any cell within a multicellular organism. So it's important to remember every cell has that genome, it's just which genes are turned on and off that determine how and what kind of function it has. And this is the same within prokaryotes to an extent, just not quite as much in the differentiation. So make sure you understand that concept. And if you have questions about that, we can talk a little bit more about it in class. But we're going to spend a whole chapter on it later this semester talking about how cells differentiate into their specific ones and how the genes are controlled. So how are all cells similar? 
all cells contain genetic information, as I just said, DNA and RNA. All cells also contain all three types of macromolecules, lipids, carbohydrates, and proteins. Lipids primarily make up that cell membrane, and then in multicellular organelles, it'll make up their organelle membranes too. So, um, so it's important to understand that these lipids provide a really big important factor in these barriers that they create. They also have a variety of other functions that we'll see as well. Carbohydrates mainly serve as the energy source for cells, but they also have an important role in modifying lipids and proteins to change the function of these within the cell so that the cell can perform its specialized functions. And of course, proteins provide a variety of functions, and we have an entire chapter dedicated to proteins coming up, so um, we'll worry about all those functions when we get there. But it's important to understand that proteins are really the thing that drives the cell. Now, as I talked about a couple slides ago, all cells contain the same information, it's just how they're expressed and what's controlling them that makes them different. So it's really important to understand that while all cells on the, on the molecular level look identical, they're all functioning differently because of different control mechanisms. And this could be anywhere from a brain cell to a liver cell to a skin cell. So it's really important to understand how that works. But let's look at another big group differentiation between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. These ones are very different. As you can see here, and hopefully as you remember, prokaryotes are very rudimentary cells. They're very small. They don't have any DNA, or they don't have any organelles. That is what defines a prokaryotic cell, is the lack of a nucleus. They don't have any of the other organelles as well, but the lack of the nucleus is what defines the prokaryotic cell. Here you can see the differences in size between the prokaryotic cell and the eukaryotic cell. The eukaryotic cell has a variety of organisms and or organelles, and we're going to go through those here in just a second. But let's cover a little bit more about that prokaryotic cell before we leave it alone. Prokaryotic cells are the simplest of all the cells. These make up the domains archaea and bacteria. These are the um, bacterial cells we think about all the time, E. coli, salmonella, or any of those um, archaea that we find in thermal vents in the sea or anywhere like that. They usually can live in fairly extreme environments, comparatively speaking to our cells. Our cells, or mammalian cells, multicellular eukaryotic cells, usually have to have a lot more um, components to their environment to, in order to make sure that they can su survive, whereas prokaryotes are a lot more hardy in that case. So it doesn't, just because they're simple doesn't mean that we should totally ignore them. It just means that they don't have the same machinery. They have huge diversity in shape and size. They're the oldest of all the cells. Um, in fact, this is, uh, we believe that they're closer to our evolutionary ancestor than we are. The eukaryotic cell is a much more complex cell as you should be hopefully very aware. We have um, multiple organelles and a nucleus within the cell. And it, eukaryotic cells, we always think about them being our cells, but don't forget there are unicellular eukaryotic cells. So it's really important that you don't forget about them as well. And all eukaryotic cells belong in the domain eukarya. So let's look at some of the important organelles in the eukaryotic or, um, cell. And this is just going to be a quick tour. We're going to spend chapters on each of these. So it's really, this is just going to be a brief overview for you. So let's start out with the nucleus, which is that big brown circle in the middle. It's surrounded by the nuclear envelope, and its primary, primary, its primary responsibility is to house the genetic information for the cell, and it serves as somewhat of the brain of the cell. You can see in orange is the mitochondria, and mitochondrion is this um, singular form of that, but most cells have multiple mitochondria. Right next to that you can see the peroxisomes and the lysosomes. Both of these are responsible for the breakdown of different um, functions within the cell. Lysosomes are specifically responsible for the waste, whereas peroxisomes have another function onto their own. All that teal that we see there is endoplasmic reticulum. And there's two types of endoplasmic reticulum. So there's the smooth endoplasmic reticulum and the rough endoplasmic reticulum. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum is responsible for um, metabolizing um, toxins and hormones, whereas it also produces the lipids for the cell membrane. The rough endoplasmic reticulum is responsible for pr producing uh, proteins that are sent to the cell membrane. So they have two very distinct functions. Once the proteins leave the RER, they're going to go to the Golgi apparatus, which will help further sort those proteins. 
Now one big part of the eukaryote cell that we haven't talked about yet is the cytosol. And in past classes you've probably heard the cytosol referred to as cytoplasm or the terms used interchangeably. So the cytoplasm is actually the liquid of the cytosol, which is like a just jelly-like substance, plus everything suspended in it. So it's the big chunky mess. Whereas cytosol is just the liquid. And it's time that we start really specifying these two terms out. So please try to differentiate those and don't use them interchangeably anymore because you want to make sure you understand that the cytosol is just the jelly. So let's look a little bit more at a couple of these organelles and how they've come to be the cells that we know. So one of the theories um, that are keys to the theory of evolution is the endosymbiont theory. And there are three organelles in the cell that play a role in this. That's the uh, nucleus, the mitochondria, and the chloroplasts. And these are because they have these double membranes and their own DNA. So all three of these organelles contain their own DNA. Now obviously the DNA of the nucleus drives the entire cell, but the mitochondria and the chloroplast have their own DNA as well. And what we have here is an image that's depicting how this endosymbiont theory worked. So what we believe is that the eukaryotic cell at some point was this large um, predatory cell that then brought in the bacterium that was on its own just a mitochondria. And when it came into the cell, they started working in symbiosis to create this new cell with the mitochondria. And we can see an example of the chloroplasts making the plants, um, the kingdom plantae here on this slide. So that's how they got that double wall, it's from being absorbed into the cell, creating the double wall of the membrane, and that's how they had their own DNA, because they were our, originally their own bacterium that then became a symbiotic relationship with the cell, creating the eukaryotic cell that we have all evolved from. So now let's talk a little bit about how we perform cell biology. We're going to talk about two different aspects of it, microscopy and model organisms. So first let's talk about microscopes. Obviously since cells are so small we need to have a tool that helps us visualize them and these are microscopes and I'm sure you've been exposing them at some point in time in one of your other classes especially here at CWI. And there's a variety of microscopes while you may have only have seen one or two of these in your time at CWI um, but there's a variety of other ones you should be aware of and we're going to go through these here in the next couple slides. So the first one is this light microscope, and this is the compound light microscope. This is the workhorse of the cell. This is the one that you've used in all of our labs. And it's a compound because it's using two lenses that compound the image. And it's a simple reflection process, and you can see that on the slide here, where the light will pass through the specimen and then through multiple lenses to reach the eye. And that allows you to view different cells, or it allows you to view different organisms or cells on a much bigger scale than you would be with with your with the naked eye. And you can see a couple examples here in A, B, and C of the different types of ways that a light microscope can be manipulated. You can see the bright field, which is what we use in the lab generally, and then you can see the phase contrast and the interference contrast. And so you can see how that changes the image here. I encourage you to study these slides um, to get really familiar with how the microscopes work, but I don't expect you to become experts in every single one of them. I just want you to be able to understand the big differences between these scopes. Now the fluorescent microscope is my favorite microscope. What we do here is we take antibodies that are tagged with specific dyes and we expose them to the cells. So in this picture you can see here, the DNA of the cell has been tagged with a green dye, whereas the microtubules have been ta tagged with a red dye. We then expose our sample to a variety of lights that will bounce off the sample and work through um, a series of mirrors and everything to reach our eye and based on what light is reflected we can see specific areas within the cell. So while we may not have been able to before make out specific chromosomes, we can at least now see where the DNA is housed or where it's being grouped within this image here. So that's how we get these images and it's all dependent on antibodies. If our antibodies are not very specific, this technique does not work very well. But this is really a main, a big workhorse for us in the lab. Now the problem with light microscopes and fluorescent microscopes is that they don't take into account that cells are three-dimensional. And so this is where the confocal microscope comes into play. It has a couple different light trajectories that create this three-dimensional image and you can see how that's different here on this, how it provides the different images on this slide. 
Confocal microscopes are really fancy and they're really nice and not all labs have them but they really help provide a lot of um, information when you're working on the structural dimension of something or you want to see how it plays out in the entire structure of the cell. And two of the most specialized microscopes that we see are transition, uh, transmission microscopes and scanning and electron microscopes. Both of these are very expensive microscopes and you may not see one unless you're working in a very specialized lab. For instance, BSU I believe only has one of these microscopes on their sites. So it just depends on what you're using. Now the big difference between transmission and scanning, well there's a difference in the technique but the big difference in the product is a transmission will provide you a cut um, a, a slice of an image and this is in how you prepare your uh, your sample whereas the scanning provides you a three-dimensional um, image and so you can see the differences here on this slide you can see how we have the slice of the cell and then we have the outside of the cell so it's important to make sure you understand how these two images or which microscope generates which kind of image so here's a little bit on how the transmission microscope works. The big thing I want you to understand about electron microscope about transmission transmission electron microscopes is this is how we can visualize organelles within the cell. This is where we get the cut off or the slices of the cell to be able to see how these organelles are functioning and what they're doing. That's what I want you to understand about transmission electron microscopes. So you can go through all this um, the, inf on the information on the slide here about how the samples are prepared but the big thing is is it provides us the image to be able to access organelles. In comparison to the scanning electron microscope which allows us to see things on the surface of the cell in a three-dimensional way. So make sure you understand that those are the two big differences. Scanning is three-dimensional surface of the cell. Transmission is one dimension inside the cell and so they provide us very different things for instance if we're looking for a receptor on the cell surface and we want to know what the shape of it looks like the scanning electron microscope is our best bet but if we want to understand what's going on in the RER of a specific cell transmission is the way for us to go so let's talk lastly about model organisms these are the workhorse besides our microscopes that we use in cell biology so what is a model organism? Well, we've already talked about how cells provide us the basic unit of uh, life, but unfortunately they don't always provide us everything we need to know. For instance, if I were to take skin cells and grow them up, I could do a lot of experiments on that, but I wouldn't be able to know how that would work in concert with the circulatory system because they don't have that aspect to them. And so this is where the model organisms come into play. They also allow for a controlled environment. If I'm always using the same set of cells or the same set of organisms, I can ensure that my, my experiments are repeatable. And this allows for a bigger, a greater picture of what's going on. Generally, model organisms are not the first place we go unless we're working with E. coli or brewer's yeast. Generally, it, we use a lot of bench methodologies before we get to a model organism because they're very expensive to use and they require a lot of time and effort. So let's look at some examples of model organisms. E. coli and yeast are the easiest ones to work with. They're single cellular. You can grow them up real fast. They have, mo they have most of the machinery of the cells that we're looking for. Obviously E. coli would be limited because they don't have all the structures of a eukaryotic cell. But then we have a couple other uh, organisms that we can work with depending on what we're focusing on. So we have Arabidopsis is our plant. So obviously if we're doing some kind of plant-based experiment we wouldn't want to necessarily use zebrafish. We would want to use Arabidopsis. The same thing goes for some of these other organisms. It's all focusing on what your goals of your, of your experiment are, which organism you can use, which is best fits best within the setup parameters of your laboratory, within your experiment, etc. There's a lot of factors that go into it and into the selection process. But it's important to know what some of our example model organisms are. As I said, one of the biggest things about them is that they are bred to be specifically homogeneous. So that if I order a batch of zebrafish tomorrow for an experiment and 10 years from now, I can guarantee that those zebrafish are going to have the same genetic information as the ones that I use tomorrow. That way I can go back to that experiment time and time again and hopefully generate the same results. And as I said, the selection comes from a lot of different things. We're looking for overlapping genomes. We're looking for um, different requirements. And so that's why it's really important that we understand what we're selecting for when we select for that model organism. 
And it, this is one of the things that you're not going to have to make that choice on for a very long time because your PIs and everything, you have to have your PhD long before you um, start picking out your own model organisms. But it's uh, important to understand these so that you can be aware of why these are selected and why they are used. And unfortunately, until we come up with a way to generate a systems biology approach in, on the bench, we won't be able to get away from animal testing or an, um, use of model organisms. So it's important to understand why we do that because when we go to use them, that we treat it with the respect that these organisms deserve and not just waste materials and resources trying to perform an experiment that we aren't fully understanding of. This is the end of our chapter one lecture. Please review those objectives. Let me know if you have any questions. Make sure you take the chapter quiz before coming to class the day we cover chapter one. If you aren't sure what day that is, please refer to the course calendar in Blackboard.